Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. The topic of this episode will be the analysis of the Ukrainian economy in the context of the second year of devastating warfare. We'll delve into discussing the changes that occurred in the key economic sectors, such as industry, agriculture, and the service sector, due to the escalated military campaign. We'll examine how the combat actions over a significant part of the country's territory impacted the infrastructure. Additionally, we'll explore how the war has affected employment levels and the population's incomes. We'll analyze the actions taken by the Ukrainian government concerning social protection and the regulation of labor relations. The Russian invasion had a devastating impact on the Ukrainian economy, a colossal blow that will take a long time to recover from. To fully comprehend this catastrophe, let's begin by reviewing Ukraine's economic position before the war. Upon gaining independence in 1991, Ukraine, in addition to its well-developed mining and processing industries, possessed advanced aviation and missile manufacturing, machinery and shipbuilding capabilities, The country was capable of producing its own airplanes and helicopters, ocean vessels, intercontinental missiles, tanks, and other military equipment. However, like many other post-Soviet states, Ukraine encountered serious challenges in developing its technological sector and machinery industry after the USSR's collapse. The country lacked an effective state policy in the fields of science, innovation, and industry. Traditional markets in the CIS countries and Eastern Europe were lost. Obstacles also included social inequality, high levels of corruption, bureaucracy, and political and economic instability in the country. As a result of these factors, Ukraine gradually shifted towards a raw material-based economic model centered on the extraction and export of natural resources, such as iron ore, metals, and grains. Private capital dominated in these sectors, consolidating the industrial heritage of the Soviet era. This model had numerous drawbacks, as it was highly dependent on fluctuations in global market prices and external shocks, which could lead to reduced incomes and increased budget deficits. Low value addition and productivity in the raw material sectors, compared to high-tech and innovative sectors, were also problems. There were also social issues related to uneven income distribution, disparities grew between regions, There was a brain drain as youth and skilled professionals emigrated and the educational and scientific systems degraded. Despite all these challenges, by 2021, Ukraine had returned to economic growth after the pandemic stagnation. The country's dollar GDP reached its highest level at $195 billion. Ukraine was an export-oriented country where exports accounted for about 40% of GDP. Food exports and grain crops played a significant role with over half of the produced food intended for export. Changes in export structure occurred over the last decade. While Russia was the largest partner, receiving over half of Ukrainian exports, the shares changed after 2014 due to Russian aggression and the occupation of Crimea. In 2021, about 40% of exports were directed to the European Union, with Russia accounting for only 5%. The raw material sector, especially the agro-industrial complex, constituted a significant part of exports, 36%, followed by metals, minerals, machinery, and the chemical industry. The prospects seemed favorable, with record harvests and high global food prices. However, the reality changed dramatically with the onset of the invasion. The economic drama that unfolded as a result of the conflict jeopardizes not only material assets, but also deeply entrenched societal structures and the country's development plans. In Ukraine, many did not believe in the possibility of an invasion until the last moment, but when Russia launched its strikes, the consequences turned out to be catastrophic. Everything was turned upside down practically within a few hours. Just imagine, almost suddenly, four million people lost their jobs. In spring 2022, unemployment soared to 30%. The country's economy plummeted an astonishing 30% by the end of 2022, 
a significant devaluation of the national currency from 29 to 39 UAH USD impacted the prices of goods and services, resulting in consumer inflation at around 27%. During the war, companies faced severe limitations in conducting international business. Border closures with Russia and Belarus, along with the paralysis of maritime ports and the capacity restrictions on the western border, created incredible challenges for foreign economic activities. Figures provided by various business associations speak for themselves. 83% of companies reported reduced business in 2022. For 29% of surveyed enterprises, the decrease ranged up to 20%, while more than half faced declines of 21% or more. Only 6% of companies did not note any changes, and an additional 11% even managed revenue growth in such a challenging period. I would like to touch upon the cost of the military actions on the country's territory for its economy. By September 1st, 2023, the level of direct damage caused by Russia's invasion reached an impressive $151 billion as estimated by the Kyiv School of Economics. This factor continues to shape the character of destruction, encompassing residential homes, educational and industrial facilities, as well as infrastructure. Amidst this catastrophe, residential properties suffered the greatest losses, estimated at 55.9 billion. A total of 167,000 homes, including private and multi-apartment buildings, were destroyed or damaged. The destruction is concentrated in regions of active combat, Second in terms of total damage remains infrastructure, assessed at $36 billion. 18 airports, 344 bridges and over 25,000 kilometers of roads were damaged. Industry and enterprises faced damages of $36 billion and $11 billion respectively. Over 426 businesses, both large and medium size, were partially or completely destroyed. The education sector also suffered with total damage reaching $10 billion and over 3,500 damaged facilities. Healthcare incurred losses estimated at nearly $3 billion, with the destruction or damage of 1,200 medical institutions. These staggering figures represent not only the economic aspect, but also the profound human toll that war leaves in its wake. According to social surveys, the majority of Ukrainians struggle to meet basic needs, with people in rural areas and those with basic education feeling this problem most acutely. A significant 64% of respondents also expressed that their standard of living has worsened compared to 70% in the previous year. In 2019, this figure was less than 40%. With the escalating economic and social consequences of the full-scale Russian invasion in Ukraine, citizens' consumer behavior is also changing. In the summer of 2023, 53% of Ukrainians stated that they couldn't afford necessary products, and 48% faced difficulties in obtaining adequate housing. Although corruption has been identified as the country's main problem, confirmed by data from the Kyiv International Institute of Sociology, where 63% of participants pointed it out. Low wages and pensions were the second highest concern, aside from the war, with 46% of respondents complaining. Following closely were high utility tariffs, demographic issues, the risk of refugees not returning, and unemployment. Despite a projected modest growth of 1-3% in GDP, the Ukrainian economy demonstrates signs of recovery only after the sharp contraction in 2022. The second quarter of 2023 saw an increase in gross domestic product by 19.5%, compared to the same period last year. The GDP recovery is driven by the resurgence of domestic consumption as Ukrainians, acclimating to the war, perceive a sense of relative stability. Yet it's important to note that this growth is conditioned by a low base, as the economy shrank by a third in the previous year. The agricultural sector emerged as a key player, bringing in five times more revenue to Ukraine in the first eight months of this year, compared to metallurgy. Previously, both sectors contributed almost equal amounts of foreign exchange. Export leaders encompass food, 14.6 billion, metals and metal products, 2.7 billion, 
Machinery, Equipment and Transportation, 2.1 billion. The trio of countries importing Ukrainian goods includes Poland, 3.4 billion, Romania, 2.6 billion, and China, 1.8 billion. However, exports to Poland decreased by 25% compared to the same period in 2022, driven by grain issues and a ban on importing certain crops from Ukraine. As a consequence of the war, 6.2 million people left Ukraine to escape the conflict, while nearly 7 million became internally displaced persons. These changes significantly affected economic activity. Household expenditures have always been a driver of economic growth in the Ukrainian economy. In the pre-war year of 2021, over 60% of GDP came from household expenses, using the consumer expenditure method. During the first year of the war, their role likely diminished, but significantly more funds in the country are being redistributed through the state budget. According to researchers' estimations, by 2032, Ukraine faces a deficit of 3 to 4 million workers. Their forecasts suggest that this could adversely affect the country's economy, causing damage amounting to $113 billion. In the face of low birth rates, this harm is unlikely to be compensated naturally, making it crucial to implement a policy that encourages the return of migrants. Currently, Ukraine is already feeling the impact of migration on economic activity. Demand for goods is decreasing, businesses are losing incentives to expand, leaving export as the only alternative, despite difficulties with logistics due to the ongoing conflict. The effect of refugees is likely to be felt on the balance of payments, which automatically affects the currency market. So far, consumption has had a substantial impact on the currency market. Many everyday goods for Ukrainians are imported. And if millions of refugees do not return, demand for these goods will decrease. On the other hand, many refugees outside the country continue to spend funds from the Ukrainian banking system. In 2022, the scale of these expenses exceeded $1.5 billion per month. At the beginning of 2023, the level of payments made by refugees abroad using Ukrainian cards remained the same. However, many of them will find employment in the countries they reside in and therefore will not spend money from Ukrainian accounts. This factor could lead to a decrease in currency outflow from Ukraine. Refugees abroad might become a source of currency inflow into the Ukrainian economy by sending financial aid to their families back home. However, as of now, we have not observed such an effect. Moreover, the volume of money transfers since the start of the major war has decreased. In 2021, labor migrants sent over a billion dollars to Ukraine monthly, whereas in 2023, these amounts are likely to decrease. Considering the potential family reunification of some refugees abroad, these amounts are likely to decrease even further. Despite the absence of millions of citizens, the National Bank of Ukraine is increasing its international reserves and the government is financing record defense spending. However, these opportunities arise thanks to the unique support of the global community, mainly in the form of concessional loans. Sooner or later, the issue of debt repayment will become an integral part of Ukrainian economic reality. According to the Ministry of Finance, as of early August, Ukraine's state and state-guaranteed debt reached $133 billion. If millions of Ukrainian refugees do not return, servicing such a volume of debt will pose increasingly greater difficulties. Consequently, creditors may push the government to repay debts through savings in the social sphere. The pension system will suffer especially. If future generations of Ukrainians in the labor market decline, the state may resort to traditional neoliberal optimization, such as withdrawing benefits or raising the retirement age to ensure pension funding. At the onset of the conflict, the labor market landscape underwent critical changes. 30% of enterprises were forced to suspend their operations within the first month of the conflict, depriving millions of their source of income. Layoffs, often occurring without proper formalities, exacerbated the situation, making job hunting harder, given the significant reduction in official job vacancies. 
Amid the wartime conditions, the government implemented measures to temporarily loosen regulations regarding hiring and firing practices. However, this wasn't an entirely novel approach, as there had been ongoing reforms in the socio-labor sphere before the invasion. This course, justified as necessary during wartime, permitted employers to lessen their responsibilities toward employees. Instead of bolstering state intervention in the economy, these actions resulted in a reduction thereof. This approach to organizing labor relations did not bring compromise and economic support, but rather granted complete authority to business owners. This model didn't emerge due to exceptional circumstances, but stemmed from the neoliberal views of the political class. Naturally, it's acknowledged that wartime is the least favorable backdrop for affirming high labor standards. The possibility of deviating from social commitments during war is provided for by the system of international labor law. The International Labor Organization, ILO, originating from the fires of the First World War, allows for the temporary suspension of labor guarantees for workers during times of war or other crises. States are entitled to restrict the rights of their citizens for the overall protection of the country. However, in the long term, it's more advantageous for society to maintain decent working conditions. The balance in approaching the narrowing of rights should be carefully considered. What then is the reality in Ukraine? From the very first days of the invasion, statements emerged that the past would not return. These declarations typically addressed the urgent need to free employers from the burden of obligations they claimed they could no longer bear. The Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry characterized Russia's armed aggression as a force majeure, justifying the untimely payment of wages. Even the right to receive wages was threatened. Labor inspections ceased due to a moratorium imposed by the Cabinet of Ministers. This created a paradox. People were deprived of their wages but had no opportunity to complain because inspectors weren't functioning across the country. Amidst Russian aggression against Ukraine, the new labor legislation has become a tool that, contrary to expectations, doesn't consistently serve the interests of defending the country. These laws, introduced during wartime, were meant to bolster defense capabilities. Ironically, their application has leaned not towards national interests, but catered to specific employers. Disguised as protection against aggression, they granted employers the leverage to manipulate labor relations in their favor. The new legislation brought an increase in the maximum work week to 60 hours, lifted bans on night shifts and overtime for pregnant women and mothers with young children, and allowed employee transfers without consent. While seemingly aimed at temporary production reinforcement, these changes threatened human capital and social justice. Unchecked labor market flexibility deepens economic instability, while employers' unilateral decisions, at the expense of workers' rights, foster discontent. During times of war demanding unity, such practices exacerbate social and economic tensions. Under the guise of wartime measures, unions become vulnerable to layoffs and member departures. Diminished financial resources and no safeguard against dismissals create an atmosphere where collective actions to protect workers' rights become challenging, if not impossible. This new labor legislation sparks tension and unfairness, jeopardizing not only economic stability, but also the foundations of social dialogue. The question remains open as to whom this legislation ultimately serves. The sole aim this law achieves is saving employers' costs by absolving them from paying for downtime, compensating delayed wages, and making contributions to unions. Yet, were these sums directed towards any socially beneficial purposes? Some argue these legislative innovations were necessary to reduce state budget spending on labor payments, yet they do not apply to civil servants. The long-term effects of labor reforms become evident. Employers become accustomed to easily manipulating situations in their favor. Some changes, seemingly neutral during wartime, begin escalating tension levels, creating social imbalance. Pre-war, unions and leftist groups effectively curbed anti-worker changes, but full-scale war changed the game rules. Protests become nearly impossible, society's attention fixates on the front lines. The experience of labor deregulation in wartime is a story of how labor relations succumb to the free market. Changes are presented as a necessary evil in defense against an aggressor. 
Could alternatives to neoliberal policies during wartime yield different outcomes? State intervention and compensations for employers would have been a reasonable path. Yet the choice favored employers' freedom of action. Social dialogue was excluded, laying the groundwork for an employment crisis. Over nearly two years of war, the Ukrainian economy has grappled with a wide array of challenges. From shattered logistics chains to the energy terror imposed by Russian forces deliberately targeting the country's infrastructure. Now, amidst the rebuilding efforts, a new challenge surfaces, a shortage of skilled labor. Companies bemoan the complexities of finding workers. A paradox emerges, job vacancies are on the rise while the number of active job seekers dwindles. The scarcity of skilled workers in the defense industry not only hampers production pace, but threatens the country's defense capabilities. The Ukrainian labor market significantly contracted after the war began. According to UN estimates, 6.2 million Ukrainians left the country. Over 1 million citizens, the exact figure is classified, stepped up for the country's defense and are not actively engaged in economic activities. The situation varies by region and sector. More new vacancies emerge in western regions. For instance, in the Zakarpatia region, farthest from active combat zones and free from shelling, the number of job openings in September 2023 doubled compared to pre-war times. However, in frontline regions, job recovery progresses sluggishly. In the Donetsk region, only a fifth of the pre-war vacancies are recorded, while in the Kherson region, it's just one-tenth. The economic structure of Ukraine has significantly shifted Many companies that previously employed tens of thousands of Ukrainians are now either non-operational, located in temporarily occupied territories, or have their facilities destroyed. This has created imbalances in the labor market. People's skills and expertise don't align with the needs of operating companies. According to one survey, 17% of Ukrainian workers changed professions since the war began. This shift is due to a discrepancy between the general shortage of skilled labor in the economy and an oversupply of labor in certain sectors. There is intense competition in the information technology sector. Apart from the war impact, the demand for workers there was shaken by a crisis in the industry that started in late 2022 due to mass layoffs by global corporations. While there is a high number of willing workers, the number of new job openings in the sector has remained stagnant. The majority of new vacancies are in manual labor, logistics, sales and procurement. Conversely, there's low demand for workers in the humanitarian, administrative and IT sectors, whereas the number of job seekers in these areas remains significant. Consequently, employment growth is sluggish and the unemployment rate remains high. By the war's conclusion, it's unlikely that job opportunities will sharply increase. The collective demand of the population, striving to meet business needs, has diminished due to a decrease in people resulting from migration. Consequently, entrepreneurs have no plans for expansion or hiring new personnel. Only retail enterprises aim for minimal staff increments, while companies in industry and services seek workforce reductions. The construction sector's employee count remains unaltered. Post-war, once Ukraine regains full access to maritime logistics and industrial recovery begins, the demand for labor will indeed surge. Yet, the country won't experience a severe labor shortage for some time due to its substantial pool of untapped workforce resources. The country boasts a significant reserve of labor, notably over one million individuals currently in the armed forces who will transition back to civilian life after the war. According to estimates by the Institute of Demography and Social Studies, there are presently 1.3 to 1.5 million unemployed individuals in Ukraine actively seeking work as per the International Labour Organization's definition. Ukraine harbors a labour reserve of 3 to 3.5 million people. However, luring them into the workforce will require effort, primarily from employers. After the war, the nation will confront a severe demographic crisis which has the potential to pose a threat to national security. Ukraine faced a demographic crisis even before the war. In the long term, the country will require additional labor resources. Who could Ukraine rely on? 
primarily those Ukrainians who left the country after February 24, 2022. Although most refugees plan to return home when it's safe, a growing number are adjusting to life in new countries. Factors that could encourage refugees to return home, aside from the war's end, include economic prospects. Among the prerequisites are well-paying jobs and social guarantees. However, not everyone will return. Estimates suggest that 1.3 to 3.3 million people might not come back. Even if Ukraine's demographic situation reverts to pre-war conditions, it will still be in crisis. Hence, in the long term, Ukraine must compete for labor resources on the global stage. Presently, many developed and developing nations experience declining birth rates and demographic crises. They vie for labor resources from typically poorer regions, enticing workers with good working conditions, safe living environments, and high social standards. To enter this competition, Ukraine doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. To encourage people to stay or return, the country needs to create numerous quality job opportunities. One of the key issues is bridging the gender gap. Regarding gender inequality in the workplace, here we witness a pattern typical of wartime. As more Ukrainians are being mobilized into the army, there is an increased demand for workers in sectors traditionally dominated by men. Now these positions are being filled by women. More and more women are entering industries like manufacturing, construction and mining. However, gender disparities and stereotypes persist in Ukraine. In 2021, the gender pay gap reached nearly 19%, worse than the EU average of about 13%. The fate of Ukraine's economy remains closely tied to the frontline situation. While the war's end promises economic resurgence, obstacles loom large. The reconstruction of ravaged cities and a shortage of labor merely scratch the surface of the nation's problems. The country's economy has shown remarkable adaptability amid war. New trade routes aided the revival of agricultural exports, once the country's primary income source. Nevertheless, next year's forecasts predict a significant budget deficit, reaching a fifth of the GDP, demanding $42 billion in funding from international partners. However, international support is waning, especially with global attention focused on other conflicts. The outlook appears worrisome. Writing off Ukraine's external debt could be a solution, but political and economic interests hinder this step. The government hesitates, justifying its stance by claiming that debt write-offs might deter potential investors in the future. Meanwhile, the external debt already burdens the country's budget heavily. Future repayments will become even more substantial, debt write-off amid the Russian invasion would be in the Ukrainian people's interest. However, decision-makers may have vested interests in maintaining the debt, having invested privately in relevant debt securities. Clearly, the country can't indefinitely rely on external assistance. Internal resources could be garnered by increasing taxation on the banking system and major private companies owned by Ukrainian oligarchs. Ukrainian banks are set to attain record profits in 2023 from government bonds, and reallocating a portion of this profit to the state budget would be rational. Parliament intends to consider raising tax rates on bank profits in the near future. Another effective approach would involve revising natural and environmental rents extracted by the state towards a fair increase. Regarding tax reductions, it would be fair to lower labor taxes to enhance the well-being of Ukrainian citizens. Nationalizing large companies could be another promising scenario. A precedent could be the government's successful nationalization and confiscation of several banks and enterprises linked to Russian capital. Alternatively, revisiting privatization outcomes, taxing profit-generating assets acquired from state funds in the past could be considered. However, the government refrains from such measures and even promises to continue privatization. Despite all trials and wartime difficulties, Ukrainians hold on to hope for a better future. Nevertheless, the reality suggests that economic progress relies on workers' confidence in the future and the revival of domestic demand. This process directly correlates with ensuring labor rights and social guarantees. Ukraine is not a case where wage costs significantly pressure the economy. 
In comparison with the European Union, the level of wages in the country significantly lags behind. Therefore, the government's policy concerning social guarantees, labor rights, and equality before the law becomes a pivotal factor. Abandoning the remaining legal guarantees may lead not to an upswing, but a downturn. Perhaps amid the explosions from Russian bombs, some inconveniences are muffled, yet we must already contemplate what lies ahead. Recently, country leaders undertook a series of measures necessary for EU membership. In the near future, assessments of Ukraine's compliance with European standards, including human rights, will be conducted. Maybe it's time to consider the benefits guaranteed by the rights to decent work and social assurances. The sooner Ukrainian policymakers stop sacrificing labor guarantees and social security for economic growth's sake, the more stability and fairness they'll bring around. This podcast is based on reliable sources that are listed in the description. You can also access the materials by following the links provided.